Thank you, Hunter, for allowing me to come speak to you all. Um, like Kenny said, my name is Andre Mitchell. I am one of the two New York City Department of Ed teacher recruitment managers. Um, myself and the other manager, um, Merrick Gohagen, are responsible for the team that actually um, does all the recruitment, the retention, and onboarding of teacher candidates across 1,800 New York City public schools. Um, I actually want to take a different approach just for the very beginning because I know that 2020 has been a whirlwind of a year and it has created a lot of misinformation specifically as it relates to the Department of Ed and application process. So I want to put to rest some misnomers or some things that folks have I've heard over the last couple of months. Um, and then I'll go into my traditional like info session deck to make sure that I always leave people what I like to call warm and informed. And that's just my way of saying you have all the key pieces of information, you have actionable steps of what to do next. And if you have any follow up questions or concerns, you know where to direct them so that you can get answers in a speedy time frame. Um, so, you know, I, I know that um, over the last seven, eight months there, folks have probably heard that the Department of Ed was hiring, wasn't hiring, hiring restrictions were there, you had to teach in certain areas, we weren't hiring all certification areas. So I will put all that to rest. The Department of Ed, yes, is hiring. Um, we did hire over the summer. We had a, an abridged hiring season than we normally do. Um, and what do I mean by that is normally our, we would have done hiring from February through May, and we call that like our early um, recruitment season, so early hiring. Um, and we have special initiatives and programs which helped match teacher candidates with principals and they could have left in May with tangible job offers. Always our bulk of our hiring recruitment season was in the months of June, July, and August. And the reason for that is the city council and the mayor approved the city's fiscal budget for the upcoming fiscal year every June. And when that is decided, that money then gets allocated to the Department of Ed and then our teams allocate the money to the individual principals and that's when they know how much money they have. So come June, it's like Christmas for them. They go shopping for as many teachers that they can afford within their budgets. Um, and so that's why our peak season has always been um, end of May, early June, July, and then it comes down in August as we can onboard teacher candidates for the start of the school year. Obviously, everything had been turned upside down this year due to COVID-19, so we had to have an abridged season, but we did hire over the summer, um, and we will be hiring for the upcoming school year. Currently, our application is closed, um, so if you are a fall graduate, so I know there's some folks who are on here who are graduating this fall, congratulations. If you are a fall graduate, I'm gonna get into more specifics about that, but that link that I just placed in the chat is where you would complete an interest form um, because our application is currently closed. Only reason why we close it right now is because we actually in the back end change up our certification, um, our uh, essay questions and responses, which we'll go into very shortly. Um, we change up some of the formatting. A lot of technical things happen over the next few months. And so for that reason, we don't want to lose track of you so you can complete this express interest form letting our central office know that you are interested in working for the Department of Ed, you're anticipating the graduation, certification, all of that. And while the system is being reset, you can still engage with the central office, you can still engage with principals in this unofficial manner. And that's what that, um, that link is for. And what I see unofficial is the information that you provide us, it's self-declared. We don't verify it and check it until a principal says, you know what, I really like Andre. I wanna hire him. Can, central office, can you verify the information that they provided? Normally, we verify everything before you even get to talk to principals, but we don't want to lose any momentum. So if you are a full graduate, um, you can use this form now if you're going to if you're looking to take a job in end of December, early January. For everyone else, for those of my spring grads, I'm going to go into the application very shortly, but that is will schedule to be open during its regular time. Um, we just, just pushed it back about three weeks, so it will be opening up at the end of January, and that will be the complete application that you'll need for the 2021-2022 school year, okay? Before I get into any nitty gritty, any questions, concerns about anything that I said thus far, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, Question is, is there still a hiring freeze for um, teachers that are certified grades first through six? Because I've been seeing that a lot and that's my certification. So great question, Priyanka. So, we had hiring restrictions, there's a difference. Um, at initially, there was a hiring freeze across all certification areas. And when we have a hiring freeze, that means no hiring happens in our agency. The mayor actually said 
um, back in March that there was a hiring freeze across all government agencies, not just the Department of Ed. There was no government agency in the city of New York that was allowed to make any hires, right? Then he said, you know what? I need to make sure that our schools and our students are set up for success so we can have hires. We're moving that hiring freeze from all city agencies. We're lifting it for the Department of Ed and there will be hiring restrictions. The hiring restrictions meant that principals could hire, but there were caveats. And what I mean by caveats, meaning that certain principals um, can only hire certain teacher candidates. So like the borough of the Bronx and parts of Brooklyn, they could have hired for any needs that they had, any certification area. So, um, Queens, you can only hire for special ed SWD 7 through 12, right? There were very specific parameters. If you wanted to hire an external teacher, meaning someone who's never taught before, taught for the Department of Ed prior, there were restrictions around that. So it did not prevent folks from hiring new teachers and or teachers in your first certification area. We just had hiring restrictions. So it meant very nuanced areas where you could have applied and taken jobs as in your certification area. So it did make it very hard because your certification area was a very finite amount of like areas in a city where principals could have offered you a position over the summer, but we did have hiring and we just called it hiring restrictions. So initially there was a hiring freeze, it was moved to a hiring restriction. As it relates for this upcoming school year, we do not anticipate that we will have any hiring freezes. There might be again more hiring restrictions. And so as we as we release that information, meaning like, hey, your certification area, you can only work in this part of Queens or you can only work on this part of Brooklyn, right? Once you're in our database system, we would let you know because we would match your certification area with the announcements that come out and say, hey, we want you to know that this is this is applicable information to your certification area. Now, what you do with that is always at your discretion, right? If we tell you that the only hiring that can happen for your certification right now is in the Bronx and parts of Brooklyn, right? And that doesn't, that's not a match of where you are interested in teaching, then yes, that might see, be very limiting for you, um, but we'll be very transparent about what the, the, what the landscape will be. Thank you, that's much clearer. Thank you so much. So I am already working with a, in a DOE public school, but through a sub company. Um, and ideally, I mean, I would love to stay, these past couple, this past couple of weeks have been great and I would love to stay in that school. Would that process be the same for application or would it be a different process? Great question, Ms. Diaz. Yes, the process will be the same. So we have, folk, we have folks who are paraprofessionals for the Department of Ed, substitute teachers for the Department of Ed, um, worked in other offices. Everyone who is a new teacher has to go through this process. Once you start working for the Department of Ed, if you want to switch schools, we have a way different process for that. If you were teaching for the Department of Ed for 20 years and you left us for one year, our current rule and policy is if you leave for the if you leave the Department of Ed and you've been gone for um, 12 consecutive months, you have to redo this exact same process that we're gonna go into very shortly. So yes, um, as a substitute teacher, even if you're working for the central office as a sub, um, you would have to apply through this process that we're gonna go through in a second, but yes, you do. Um, now, once you're in this process, if you speak to your administrator, your principal, your assistant principal at that school and say, hey, you know what, I'm interested in really teaching your school, are you anticipated hiring from my certification area? He or she says, yep, I am, I love you, I wanna have you. They would then go pick you out of our bucket, right? And then they would assign you to their school. The reason why you have to still do this process, even if a principal tells you before you even start your application that I really wanna have you at my school this year is, you wanna get paid. And without doing this process, we can't move your paperwork from the application process into our payroll system. And so that's why everything that you complete in this gets actually pulled into other database systems as you actually get hired in the job. So long answer, yes. There's a question about, yep. does the DOE provide H-1B sponsorship for international students? Great question, that always comes up. Great question, everyone. So for that one, yes, we do. Now we have moved over the last couple of years from the central office, meaning um, 65 Court Street, downtown Brooklyn, being the agency that is responsible for issuing and sponsoring prospective teacher candidates, we moved those, those responsibilities and tasks from the central office to the individual schools. So we do, but it would require a principal who is willing to hire you and take the cost of what it means to sponsor you out of their school's budget, not the central budget. We normally, we used to, a couple years back, we would carry all those costs at the central office. We said it is now is the, the principal or the school who's going to do that's responsibility. Now, um, 
that your visa, once you graduate, I, if I remember correctly, already allows you one year to teach in the US. And then after that initial year, you would have to get the sponsorship. Um, and so that's the conversation that you can also speak to our international office team about, um, about the specifics, because they track all of that for each individual school. But you should be able to work with no problem for your first year upon graduation, but after that, you should be needing your sponsorship. And one of the first links I put in, in the chat was actually our online database system. We started it um, early last year and we had to rev it up much faster because of COVID-19, but we have a 24 hour 365 um, automated system now that's online where you can put in your questions or concerns, the algorithm will respond to you and give you answers, or it will allow you to create a ticket for someone from our central office to contact you back. This way you can get your questions and answers. Um, you can get the responses to your questions 24 hour 365 no matter where you are in the world and if it's not if the computer system can't respond to your individual question because we didn't program it in there a person a physical person will contact you back to actually respond to you so that was the first link we call it zendesk it's a it's an automated like uh, ai system which it's beautiful please take advantage of it okay um what i'm really going to talk about is two is um first is why teach for new york city department of ed i'm actually going to jump to section three the actual application process and then if i have time i'll go into section four finding your fit but i really want to make sure i get into sections one and three and answer all everyone's questions and give people next step actionable steps okay why well, teach for the department of ed okay new york city department of education still remains to be the the largest school district in the country we encompass 1800 schools across the five boroughs of new york city that's Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and sometimes I even recognize Staten Island as our, as our, our stepson, stepchild. Um, like I said, we encompass 1,800 school communities across all, all five boroughs. Um, and what does that mean? With 1,800 schools, you truly can find your fit. Um, now again, there, there are, um, la this last, pine, hiring, last cycle, there were some caveats to that, meaning that you had to go in certain areas depending on certification. Um, we're hoping that that will not be the case at all for this upcoming school year, but I, what's true today may not be true tomorrow. So when we when these things are announced, we'll please, we'll let you know. Um, but you wanna make sure that you're in our application process in our system so that you can get updated information um, as we go throughout. One of the things that we've prided ourselves in is that we've designed a system where you can grow and then we try to empower you all throughout your career. So if you want to start off as a teacher and move into an administrative role, we have programs and supports and resources that actually help you do that. If you want to move from being a, a teacher into our central office to work on curriculum, working on testing, et cetera, we have those opportunities. We really want to design our school system to be one where you can actually start your career and retire, right? We want to make sure that you have fulfillment in all aspects of your job life and through professional development training, through job growth opportunities, through um, incentives, we've tried to make sure that we've incorporated all of that because we want, we truly do value, and this is our way of putting our money where our mouth is. Okay, now one of the things I know folks always want to know, what are the Department of Ed salaries? Great question. So if you are starting with a bachelor's degree and no prior teaching experience, our starting salary is 59,291. That's 59,291, and that's across all certification areas, regardless of where you teach and your certification. We do not count your prior, we do not count your student teaching as prior teaching experience. What is considered prior teaching experience, if you were a full-time appointed teacher working at a parochial school, working at a charter school, right? That counts as prior teaching experience. If you were teaching in another state, um, that counts as prior teaching experience. If you were a paraprofessional, it's not a one-for-one -one ratio, meaning like for every year that you were teaching as a paraprofessional, you would get credit as a teacher. I'll tell you what they will apply that, that experience that you did as a paraprofessional or substitute teaching, because there are ways that you can apply that to, to other credits, but it won't, it won't apply to your salary scale or differential. And I'll explain what those two things are in two seconds. But your starting salary for a bachelor's with a bachelor's degree and your initial certificate is 59,291. Okay. Remember that's regardless of where you teach and regardless of your certification. We, if we high, paid someone higher because they had a math certification over someone who had an art certification, that would be our, uh, our implicit way of saying that we value a math teacher over an art teacher. So it is uniform. We pay people um, the same. Your, your, your salary only gets adjusted or goes up depending on your years of experience and education. So it's a merit increase only by years of education 
and experience, right? Not because you have a different certification over another. Now the master's plus 30 is a different conversation, but um, but again, the caveat to that is master's plus 30, so 30 additional credits. So again, your, your salary is higher because you have additional education experience, okay? If you have a master's degree with no prior teaching experience, the starting salary is 66,652, and the same thing applies there. It's the same thing no matter what your certification area is and no matter where you teach, and the same rules apply for um, what we consider as prior teaching experience for the bachelor's level as well, okay? And one of the things I wanna make sure that we highlight, we have a comprehensive health insurance plan, dental, vision, and prescription drugs. Your dental and your vision is actually issued to you through the UFT, United Federation of Teachers. That union is the one that is responsible for the issuing of your, your dental and vision, but they have a phenomenal dental and vision plan. Your comprehensive health insurance plan and prescription drugs are issued through the Department of Ed. We have about nine healthcare providers that you can choose from, um, and you can always change that through open enrollment period, which is currently right now for the Department of Ed, so that you can have a plan that's matching your current fa family and medical needs. Um, and not many places have nine healthcare provider options for you to choose from. And that could be from Emblem Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield, it goes on and on and on, okay? One of the other things I want folks to know is you have the option to elect to enroll in the, in the UFT, United Federation of Teachers, UFT for short. Now, it is not required. It is an option. However, even if you are not a member or do not enroll as a paid member as, of the UFT, you still benefit from the UFT's contract negotiations with the Department of Ed every three to five years. So every three to five years, we sit back down at the collective bargaining table with the UFT to negotiate cost of living increases, salaries, et cetera, right? So even as a, UF, uh, as a non UFT member, you still would benefit if we change the salary scale, you would benefit from that negotiation regardless. Um, but you do have the option to be a paid member into the UFT, okay? Enrollment into a pension plan. We are one of the few systems that still offers a pension plan. Once you're vested, you're guaranteed your pension or a percentage of it, right? That's that you may not be thinking about retirement now, but trust me, it is something that you will want as you get older and start getting thinking about retirement. It's a great security nest. Um, and numerous discounts, promotions from a number of retailers, health clubs, entertainment venues, and travel services. Now, many of these may seem far-fetched now because we're in COVID-19, we're still dealing with the pandemic, but when things return back to normal, right, you can get numerous discounts on things like your cell phone provider, um, traveling for vacation with families, um, auto insurance, discounts for when you're trying to buy your home, et cetera. It runs the gamut, retailers, um, rental cars, cars, period, everything, you name it, we have negotiated ways for you to hold on to more of your, your net um, that you bring home every year, right? We wanna make sure that you can hold on to more of that. So we've negotiated cost saving places for you to save a little bit here, 10%, 15%, 20%. Right? Um, I personally always take advantage of the Verizon. They take off 20% of my monthly bill being a, um, a, um, a being a, an administrator for the Department of Ed. Let me pause here for a moment and we can take three questions as it relates to salary and benefits. So three questions we have time for. If I teach in private schools, like I know you talked about if they were in a charter school or if they were in uh, um, out of state, but what about a private school? Great question. So yes, you can get credit if you were teaching at a private school. Again, for all of those, all of those, the private school, parochial school, charter school, right? You have to just been a full-time appointed teacher. So we'll trust, but we're going to verify. So when you start to, when you get your onboarding process to become um, sort of, to, to take a job at the Department of Ed, and you sit down with our HR rep and you say, hey, you know what? I have my master's degree um, and I've actually been teaching for three years. So I want to be on the master's degree, but three years prior teaching experience pay scale. They're going to say, perfect. Provide me proof of evidence. Were you a full-time appointed teacher um, for three years? How do I prove that? Do you have pay stubs to show that you were being paid, right? Full-time appointed. You have to mean, I want to make sure that you were being paid as a full-time teacher, right? Were you evaluated in that role, right? And so you have to show that I actually, somebody came out to actually show me that I are or, or, or check for my performance evaluations. I have tangible proof to show that I was evaluated. If not, you'll have to go back and get that. They'll start you at the master's degree with no prior teaching experience until you can provide them with the proof of both of those things, your, sal your salary that you're being paid, right? Um, and um, your evaluations. The HR rep will tell you what they can take as proof of each one of those categories. But yes, teaching at a private school does count as prior teaching experience as long as you were evaluated in your time there and you were paid while you were there. And that's one of the reasons why we don't carry, for salary, we can't count substitute teaching um, as um, prior teaching experience because you're not evaluated in that sub role um, by an administrator. 
but yes. Cool. All right. Um, the dual masters one, I would say, if you could provide them with the link, I guess, where they could see the salary scales, because dual certification masters, that could run the gambit. Um, if you could talk about schools with um, extra income opportunities, like per session, that's, you know, related to per session, if you could cover per session. Um, yeah. Somebody asked about bench, you know, um, pensions. How, how many years does it, you know, um, take to be vested in a pension plan? And then the last one, I guess, um, I'm kind of trying to synthesize some of them about yeah. assistant teachers or associate teachers. I guess that comes under the same rule as substitutes in terms of counting as prior teaching experience. Yes. So I, in no particular order, I'll address all of those. So yes, you, you, you were probably as a teacher's aide, probably not assistant teacher was not evaluated. Um, if not, I'll make sure I'll leave my email or you can put it, uh, you can put that question to Zendesk and I'll ask you some follow-up questions to make sure that we, um, we can give you the correct response. But most folks aren't evaluated in, in that kind of role. Um, so that's why they can't count that as probably teaching experience. Now, I'll, I'll pull that into the next question as it relates to pension. So even if you were teaching as a substitute teacher, paraprofessional, assisting, assistant teacher, teacher's aide, et cetera, right? That counts as time that you can get credit for to be vet, to book closer to your retirement, right? So what do I mean by that? Great question. So if you were teaching for four years as a substitute teacher, right? You can't get prior teaching experience in that to go higher up on a pay scale. However, you can sit down with the HR and say, I was teaching for four years as a substitute teacher. I would like to apply those four years I was subsing towards my retirement, right? So under the current rules and regulations, it's 10 years for you to be vested, right? And so if you come in saying, I want to get credit for four years, that means you would be vested in six more years, right? So same thing for that teaching aid, teaching assistant, right? So you can say, hey, I taught for one year. I want to get credit for that one year I was teaching. Can you apply that towards pension? Perfect. Well, apply it towards pension. You only have to teach for the Department of Ed for nine more years, and then you would be vested, right? Now, to the other question as it relates to um, salary, I just dropped a link within the chat for everyone, which takes you to our teachnyc.net webpage, which also breaks down our salary scale and differential. So there are columns, right? So salary scale and differential. The, what the difference between those are salary scale is if I teach with a bachelor's degree, right? And I haven't, and I haven't got my master's yet, right? So my bachelor's degree with one year is there. Year two is there, year three, year four, year five. Your differential is the, the, if you've been teaching for three years with a bachelor's degree and by year four, you earned your master's, right? You're not going to go to a master's degree as and a first year teacher. You're going to get a master's four years prior teaching experience. So the differential is when you move between certifications and ex education levels and experience. Your salary scale is just that you have the incremental increase every year that you come back to the teaching table because you have more teaching experience in your toolkit and you should be compensated accordingly. So year one, year two, year three is there, right? But then if you were teaching for four years, now you earned your master's, you'll jump to the differential, you'll jump to the master's level, but four years prior credit. So you would see a dramatic increase there because now you change education levels in addition to years of experience. Okay, so I think I answered well, um, Kenny, if I didn't, if I, if I, let me know if I missed anything, that was the pension question. Um, yes, you should take advantage, take advantage of the pension. Um, you can get credit for prior teaching experience um, as it relates to your pension. But in that example, the teaching assistant, if you weren't evaluated, it will not count towards the years of experience for education to get your um, prior teaching experience to get um, credit towards your higher scale. And then for those who wanted to see the salary scale, I just dropped the link within the chat for folks to see. I think oh. I covered all of them. Yeah, no, that, that was pretty comprehensive. And you can now teach NYC website. I'm just going to drop that in there. Teach NYC.net. You can see our healthcare providers um, that we have. Um, for anyone to be added to your healthcare coverage, they have to be a dependent of yours. So, spouse, domestic partner, children, adopted children, birth, uh, natural birth, whatever it is, they have to be a dependent for you to be on the city's health coverage. Um, so, that relates to that. The, if you go to the teachnyc.net, it'll let you know what our current list of providers are. Um, and again, more specific nuances, absolutely. Just speak to the HR rep that will be assigned to you once you have a school that's offering you a job. And we're going to speak to existence. Everyone from Hunter is going to get hired. Hunter, I think, can you also speak to the numbers? Um, Hunter actually 
puts out um, a, a, an astronomical amount of teacher candidates every year. And I believe that they have, remember from last looking at it, something like, obviously COVID-19 was the exception to the rule, but in prior years, something like 85 plus percent of the teacher candidates who apply from Hunter who are looking for jobs acquire a job um, in their first go around. Um, you come to the table with that much experience. Kenny provides so much support and resources to make sure that you are well warm and informed to compete against any other um, teacher candidate across the state. So absolutely. Um, and you know, it, most of the time I feel like folks don't acquire a position because it's maybe not the right fit. They're really looking to work within a borough like Queens and we'll talk about why that's hard or problematic at times. Um, but no, Hunter absolutely, you know, 300 plus teacher candidates a year, um, across our 1800 schools and you're highly sought after with the amount of education experience that you have and you wouldn't be surprised normally that um, For those who are doing their student teaching in a school or subbing in a, in a school once you let an administrator know that you're getting your bachelor's or master's of ed um, At Hunter. They're like, oh, I really, you know, let's talk, you know, so Kenny is absolutely right uh, Amanda, I think I saw your hand up earlier. You said something about um, Benefits like as in like government loans the DOE does do that for teachers, right? Um, we do not personally issue uh, loans. However, as a municipal worker, because as a teacher, you are a municipal worker, you have access to several providers that we work with. So as an example, um, Municipal Credit Union, MCU for short, is a credit union which is specifically designed for city, state, and federal employees who work within the five bars of New York City. And so the Municipal Credit Union was created by Mayor Mitchell, ironically, um, back in the 60s. Um, and the design of that was to give city employees the opportunity to borrow money at a very low cost rate and or to save their money in an in entity or body that gives them a higher percentage return on their investments than other banks and its financial institutions. So MCU is an example where we have a partnership as a city employee. You have to show that you're a city employee with your pay stub, your government ID, et cetera, they'll create an account and they issue you home loans at, at a very low cost if you compare to a competitor. Now, also when you go onto our, um, um, our HR Connect website, we have places like Quicken Loans and things like that that we, um, we have, we have um, negotiated things with. And that's some of those fringe benefits that we talked about where they'll say like, we actually give you $4,000 credit towards your closing cost as a New York City teacher. Um, or we're gonna cover your, um, we'll cover your, um, um, whatever something. And then also as a UFT, you have access to an attorney to, 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 to represent you at, like if you're buying a home. So yes, there are programs like that. We specifically don't, they don't handle it. There are other arms that do that we've collaborated with, but you will have access to them as a teacher. A great question. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna speed through because I wanna make sure that I get to the meat and potatoes and that's really what folks are gonna really need to be prepared for. So I'm gonna jump through some of these things um, right now so I can give a big, priority of time to this. So currently on the screen is our high demand subject areas. These are not the only areas that we are hiring for. However, these are our high demand subject areas. So if you are on track to be certified in one of these or have the option to get an extension of your license into one of these, that's gonna make you that much more highly competitive in the job market. What we're trying our best to do as an agency is truly let people know about where the job market demands are gonna be three to five years out so that you can know like, okay, maybe I wanna get an extension or maybe I wanna get certified in this to make sure that I am in high demand once I hit the market looking, looking to be certified. And these are not just high demand subject areas for New York City Department of Ed, these are across the state and many of these are across the country. If you ever go to the US Department of Education's website and they have great links in there which tell you what are the high demand subject areas or teacher shortages or by each state and by each area of each state, if you look at some of these, these are uniformed across the country. So if you're in one of these areas or on track to be certified in one of these areas, you, the world is your oyster no matter where you want to teach within the state of New York and honestly almost across the entire country. Okay, this is um, our pre-K and 3K for all sites. We are still hiring for those. Um, right now, you still have to wait till the application re reopens, but for those who are interested, who are graduating in the fall, you can put in an interest form. Um, you have the option to teach for a district school, and that's um, as a certified teacher. The district school is a New York City Department of Ed entity. You can teach for a pre-K center as a certified teacher candidate. Um, um, and so the pre-K centers are, are standalone buildings, which are not attached to a DOE, um, a DOE building. So we have, we have leased or bought spaces that are not 
our already pre-established school building, which already had grades like K through 12 or K through nine in it, as an example, to facilitate 3K and pre-K for all. We've also contracted with charter schools and also what we call New York City Early Education Centers. Those are third party vendors that are facilitating pre-K for us. If you're teaching at a pre-K school, a uh, NICE or a charter school, you are an employee of that entity, but we have what we call pay parity. So the pay scale as a certified teacher is the same amongst all four of those entities that are listed there, but the fringe benefits, salary, pension, et cetera, I'm sorry, not salary, pension, healthcare providers, all of that changes for if you're teaching at a charter school or an ICG. It may not be the same as the Department of Ed, but we have pay parity where you're being paid the same. Um, charter schools, again, you're an employee of that entity, NYSEEC, they vary in size from things like the YMCA to the Archdiocese of Brooklyn and Queens to even a small entity like their learning experience, like smaller entities, right? But each one of them have phenomenal programs. And I saw a question pop up. I can pause for take one question. Somebody wants to get clarification about what falls on the secondary subjects, and then somebody else wants to know about hiring for the arts because they heard that arts were going to be severely cut, um, I guess, due to distant um, blended learning. Got you. So no specifics have rolled out about the arts and what cuts will come down the pipeline if there are any. Um, however, again, and when we're going to go into the application, being in our system, we'll make sure to keep you warm and informed as it relates to if there are cuts or there are restrictions about where art can be hired. Um, arts has been for many years has been um, an area where the city and the mayor has funneled a lot of money into to enhance art education. So I doubt that we're going to see major cutbacks and, and, and changes to that because, you know, listen, we've just invested a lot of money to increase the amount of art teachers in our programs because we know that that has tangible, um, transferable things that relate to like math and sciences and et cetera. And it also allows folks to um, explore their creativity side. Um, so no, I don't, nothing on that. And then what was the first one? Oh, it was um, about um, secondary subjects. What subjects are considered the secondary um, subjects, you know, like math, science, social. Got you. Got you. So you probably are talking about the secondary subjects and that's all seven through 12 certifications. And yes, like Kenny said, that's the math, that's the sciences, anything that would have you certified to teach on the secondary level grades, um, seven through 12. Um, and so that's what we consider the secondary subjects. A lot of that again is like, um, um, uh, math sciences, bilingual SPED, et cetera, it goes on and on, um, but that falls within there. Um, really the, the adolescents. Oh, and then are fringe benefits available for standalone um, pre-K centers? Oh, yes, yes. So the first two, the district schools and the pre-K centers, all of these are, you're considered a New York City Department of Ed employee. So all those fringe benefits that we talked about before, don't change. If you're teaching at a district school, you're actually teaching in, a, in, a, in an established DOE school building, PF 346, and we added classrooms into that building to offer 3K and pre-K. A pre-K center is just, we just bought a building or leased a building and it's not attached to a DOE school building that was already pre-existing before the initiative started, but you are still a DOE employee um, and all the fringe benefits remain the same. Only the, the last two charter schools and NICE change in fringe benefits. But great question. All right, and so this goes through um, some of our increased, right? This was what our paid parity that we were talking about. So come, um, this is what the, how we were doing the increments of what we were, we were at the mayoral pay parity scale. And so right now we're already into the 10, 1, 20, right? Pay parity scale. And so by 10, 1, 21, if you're teaching for a 3K, pre-K for all site, either at those charter schools or NYSEX, this is what we are requiring of them to pay. Um, minimum, right? So it can't be lower than these. This is what the, the requirements have been set. Um, and so the last one will be by 10 one is what those 3K and pre-K centers have to offer. So we were just scaffolding it for them so that they can play catch up. But right now we're at the second leg of this. And then the third leg of what we're required of them happens next year. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna jump to the application. Okay, so as Jason talked about earlier, there are two teach accounts. You have a teach account with nyse.gov, and that's the New York State Education Department. And he uses one of my favorite analogies also, right? Like if you are looking to be certified, I'm sorry, if you're looking to be a truck driver for UPS, Amazon, right? You need to get your CDL, commercial driver's license from the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? And so that agency 
handles all the driver's license across the state, but you apply to UPS directly for the job or Amazon directly for the job. So the same principle applies here. You apply no matter where you wanna teach in the state of New York for your license and pay your licensures and fees to nyseed.gov, but you apply to each individual district system or school entity that you're looking for. Now we have centralized it where all the schools across our, eight, our five boroughs, all 1800 public schools, you go through our system. And again, it's also called TEACH. In a, in a better world, we would have talked to each other at the state level and the city level and said, let's all call it something different, not to confuse people. But there are two TEACH accounts if you're considering teaching for the New York City Department of Ed. The second TEACH account is at teachnyc.net. And that's the link that I gave you there before. It has ample resources. And it is one application for all 1800 schools we tried to apply the same academic principle as if you were using the common application to apply for college, right? So it's one application and it can be used for all schools instead of you having to apply for every specific school that you're looking to work for amongst our 1800 schools, okay? And our application, when it will reopen um, in, in, in end of January, um, you will see this on our Teach NYC site. You'll see the carousel, it, a new picture passes every 30 seconds and it's an application open. Right now on the carousel, it'll say certified teachers who are interested, click here for more info, but I gave you that link of where it'll take you to fill out our interest form. Uh, but when it opens, it is one application at teachnyc.net for consideration for all 1800 schools. Now I know one of the best questions that always comes up, do I need to be certified and have my, my licensure in hand from the state teach account before I apply to teachnyc.net? Great question, the answer is no, you do not need to have your licensure in hand before you apply to complete your application at teachnyc.net. You just need to be on track to be certified and we'll ask you periodically for updates and to confirm that you're on track by the date that you gave us initially when you created your application. But I repeat, you do not need to have your New York State teaching license from nyscd.gov before you apply to the teachnyc.net, all right? Um, and so let me go into the application and then I'll pause for some questions, okay? so. When you go into the application process at teachnyc.net to apply for the New York City Department of Ed for all 1800 schools, it is one database system, even though it's called Teach, for many different certificate or for many different people considering for the Department of Ed. So one, you're gonna create a profile, right? It takes about two minutes, my name, my email address, my mailing address, my phone number, right? My social security number. It is a secure government site. So please put it in, it is required, right? Trust but verify, we have to verify that you are on, you are eligible to work within the US because we are a government agency, right? So it's gonna ask you to create a profile, just like if you were creating a profile for Twitter or, or Facebook, et cetera, right? That information from your profile then gets you carried over to the application portal. When you're in the application portal, it's gonna be a drop down menu. You have to choose which application you're looking to complete school counselor, school social worker, school nurse, right? You're gonna pick the teacher application. Many times we have to switch people and say you have to redo the application. You're a certified nurse or you're a certified teacher but you completed a school psychology application, right? You need to redo your application. So please make sure from the drop down after your profile, you complete the certified teacher or on track to be certified teacher application. It's all one and the same but it make sure it's the teacher application in the drop down menu. The first thing it's gonna ask you is for proof of New York State certification. I know, you're gonna say, Andre, you just said two seconds ago, I don't need to have my New York State certification in hand to do the TEACH um, website. You're a liar. I'm not. We ask you to show us proof that you're on track to be certified, right? So you can take, you can get a certification letter from Jason or whoever your certification person is, right? That says that Andre Mitchell is on track to be certified. And if he completes his components by this date and time, we are, we truly believe that he will be certified to teach for the upcoming school year, right? It's a form letter, they'll put it in, you can upload that like you would anything in Blackboard. Um, if you can't get that letter, you can provide us proof of your teach account at nyscd.gov to show us that you have completed your teach account, you started it, you have things on file with them, right? So you can upload screenshots of that. But the easiest thing is just get that form letter from Hunter to say that you're on track to be certified by A, B, and C date and time. The next, app, next part of the application will ask you to upload your resume and work history. So your resume, should be specific to education. I don't care that you sold shoes at Aldo in your resume, right? Your resume should be succinct and specific to your education experience or your potential to teach as an effective teacher, right? So it should have things that are relevant to education. Now in the work history part of your application, that's where I care that you taught about Aldo, right? Tell me about all those transferable skills. And I say that because I, I sold shoes at Aldo in undergrad um, in DC. So that's why I chose that analogy. 
But yes, tell me about all your work history from when you still, when you delivered papers at 13 to what you just recently did that's outside the field of education. Then it's your academic history. You're gonna upload your recent transcripts, official or unofficial from Hunter, right? So that we can see what courses that you have taken, right? And so some schools do not release your transcripts until you have paid the bursar's office. So make payment arrangements, make a promise to give them your firstborn child, whatever you need to do that they can release to you, at least in the unofficial copy of your academic transcript. So you can upload that just like you would anything at the Blackboard. And then you come into the next part of the application, your essay question components. Now we change these periodically, right? So the question from last year may or may not be the same from this year or tweaked or adjusted, right? But that's where the bulk of your time will be spent in application. You can get that form letter from Jason before you sit down to work on your application for the Department of Ed. You can have your resume completed and have it uh, approved and looked through by the Career Services Center and make sure it's clean and current grammatical and punctuation errors, right? You can sit down and type in quickly all your work history. You can already have a copy of your academic transcripts that literally you go through those parts of the application fairly quickly that you can just save your application, copy and paste the question that's been assigned to you, paste it into a Word document, work on it for a day or two, give someone a chance to read through it, edit it, have a professor give you feedback, right? And then you can go back and then um, paste it back into your application where you saved and paste, saved your application at that point of where you were, and then move on to the last part, your professional references, right? Those first three buckets you can do beforehand and set yourself up to success that you can breeze through it, that your bulk, your meat and potato, where you're gonna spend your energy is your essay questions. And please, I highly recommend for folks not to do your essay question in one sitting, right? Read the question, make sure you understand it comprehensively, respond to it, Allow someone to check it, make sure that they feel like you have answered the question to your best of your ability and you've captured all the components, right? It's clean and curve grammatical and punctuation errors. We literally read every single aspect of every application. Or on average, we get somewhere up close to 12,000 applications. We read every single one. On average, we've been hiring other than COVID, um, like I said, because of the bridge timeframe, on average, we were hiring somewhere close to 6,500 to 7,000 teacher candidates across all certification areas. Every school year, we were receiving 12,000, so half or a little about half of the teacher candidates that applied to the Department of Ed every year were being hired, and we read every single application. We score every single application. I repeat that, we score every single application, right? Andre, do I get to see my score? No, it is a pass fail for your side, but we score your application because that's how we rank you in our system, right? Why is that important? If you scored 99.999% on your application, right? right? It's used as a way for us to be fair and equitable. And what I mean by that is if you applied today and you're certified in math and I apply tomorrow and I'm certified in math, how do I list you in a database system that's fair and equitable, right? So we rank you by your scoring. Um, and so the person that had 99.9 .9 goes before the person that had a 99. Now, as the person that got hired, comes off the list, right? You move from two to one. If three becomes two, so it's a living document. It constantly goes up and down. But that's not that's not anything to stress about because what's really principal is gonna look at, they don't see your score either, only the central office does. Um, but what's really applicable to that is that if once you apply to the Department of Ed and you're in our database system, principals are really doing a, a search by where you're saying you wanna teach, right? And so in your application, you'll say, what are your top three bar preferences? And that's how we communicate to you, right? If you say Bronx is your fourth bar preference, you'll get very little information about from our central office about openings within the bar of the Bronx. You'll primarily get that from us about where your first two top choices are and a sprinkle of what your third is. We rarely give you information about your fourth and your fifth, right? But your scoring is mainly attached to your essay questions, responses, and your resume. Right, again, I repeat that. Your scoring comes from your essay questions and your resume, right? Your proof, there's no points attached to that. Your professional references, there's no points attached to that. Your academic history, uh, no points attached to that. Those are proof that you are on track to be certified. That's verification. Your essay and your resume are where the responses are, uh, where your scoring comes for, for, from your responses to us. Now we have a comprehensive application guide. You literally can Google. Um, right now we haven't put the 2020, 2021 um, guide up, but the 19 to 20 application guide is you literally can Google New York City Department of Ed online teacher application guide in any search engine. It's a comprehensive PDF document, which literally gives you step-by-step -step tools and resources of how you can execute an effective essay response and a sample resume, right? And you should also make sure that people have read it from the career services for your resume, a professor has read through your essay response, or you can get 100%. And like I said, for your side, it's a pass-fail. 
right? Do people fail it? Yes, but I'm giving you so much support and resources that that should not even be a possible option, right? Let me pause, take two questions as it relates to the application process before we move on. Okay. If you fail the application, what's the next step? But if you go to Hunter, you would never fail the application. So I'm just kidding, uh, but Andre will cover that. <laughs> yes, so hold on, let me drop the last version of the um, teacher application guide in there for folks. Again, this was the 20, 19 2020 version if you fail it we do not have an arbitration process where you can um challenge the decision um, meaning that you failed the application um you're very welcome folks um i saw some thank yous you're very welcome um you you cannot challenge it unfortunately you would have to wait to the next application cycle um to reapply for the department of ed but again if you use this online teacher application guide there is no possible way you can't pass um, the scoring rubric um, to actually like see, you know, to, to get through the application process. And I know the next question is, when I say that, is the, is the scoring rubric in the application guide? No, we practice the same academic principle as when you applied to Hunter, right? You applied to Hunter and I, an admissions committee reviewed your application and offered you acceptance or denial into the institution. The same principle applies here. The rubric is your internal document. If we released it, then everybody would just match the scoring process, like the scoring requirements, and then it wouldn't be a rubric anymore because then it just would be, it would just be something people use as a guide to get in, right? So the rubric is for our internal team for when they look at your application and the same thing, you're either accepted or denied into it. You don't, the scoring only matters on our end of how we list you in the system. But again, that's only so that we, we can be fair and equitable because it wouldn't be fair if you applied earlier that you get listed in a database system before somebody who gets who applies three weeks later right so it's just so that we can rank you in the system and then it's a living document it keeps moving ups and flows just like how a google search would be right one is there it goes up as something else gets deleted etc so that's what that that's um really for i hope i answered both of those questions um, i really want to get into the, um one more about, sure. well first let me just add to people we have the Rockowitz Writing Center. I've already spoken with them for the last several years. If you feel like you need support with your writing, once you complete the essays and you bring the prompt to them, they'll go over your essay with you to make sure that you responded to the question appropriately. So to Andre's point, you have no reasons for failure with the essay because there's too many supports that are free and available at Hunter that at your disposal to use and then somebody asked the question about professional references on the application so um if you want to cover that sure so when we say professional references it should be somebody that can speak to your potential of being an affected teacher so the administrator for the school that you did your student teaching um the lead teacher for who you were doing your student teaching in a professor at Hunter who's observed you, I would probably choose a professor at Hunter where you did well in their class, not the one that you possibly might have got a C in, but the one that's an A. I say that because you'll be very surprised sometimes, right? So make sure that you they can, they can talk to your potential and effectiveness of being a teacher. Your professional references should be majority attached to the career of teaching. If you were teaching in an after school or summer camp program, the director can write you a letter, yes, I would make that one. I wouldn't make that the only one that you have, right? That is the professional references are optional. They are not mandatory in our application process, but why it's important to have that. If they're trying to decide between a, um, Kenny and myself for a teacher candidate position, right? They're going and they're, they're hem and hawing between which one for us to go with. They'll look at your professional references to see what they can, what they say about you and your potential. It is not a link where that you submit it to them and they submit it and you never get to see it. You have to upload it on their behalf. So you should see what they're writing and you determine, you determine if you actually want to apply it to your application. But you know, that's why they make the distinction. So like if Kenny has stronger professional references that can talk to why he would be a phenomenal teacher in my school, they're gonna go with Kenny over me, unfortunately. Congratulations, Kenny. Sorry, Andre, but it doesn't mean that I won't find a job. It just meant that I lost out on this one, right? Again, it's about the right fit. And so really making sure that you, yes, Kenny, you got it, congrats. But um, yes, it's about making sure it's the right fit. And so like, how do I know that you're right fit? What, what can people say about your transferable skills, the things that you've learned, the things that they've seen you grow, like have them talk about all those things, right? But that's what the professional references go to. In that guide on one of the pages, I think seven, don't quote me if that, it gives you a sample resume. The resume does not have to look exactly like our sample resume. However, again, however, the content that's listed on the resume should be on yours. So 
if it says, um, you know, what is your certification, et cetera, like that needs to be somewhere on your resume. Again, your resume does not have to match ours verbatim or to the T, but just the content that we're looking for on our sample resume that we listed on our sample resume, you should also have somewhere on your resume format, whichever one that you decide to use, okay? Now, while we have a few minutes left, and then I'll leave the floor open for questions, I'm just gonna go through one other slide, and then I'll leave the rest of the time to really make sure that I leave everybody with everything answered or next steps, okay? The application process has three increment emails that you'll get. Once you hit submit on your application, it's a confirmation email that you'll get 30 seconds. The system automatically sends it just like an automated system, right? Once you hit submit, you cannot go back and change your essay response, right? You can always go back and download and re-upload your resume. You can change that over time, right? Because your first resume should say like anticipated graduation, then after you graduate, you want to download it, download it and re-upload a new one that says like graduation or degree confirmed, right? So you can change that. But your essay prompts, once you hit submit, bye-bye, it's done. So you'll get a 30, after 30 seconds to a minute after you hit submit, you'll get an email from, your, from us saying your confirmation that your application is in our database system. That's confirming that it's in our system. If you don't get that, email us. We'll make sure we'll confirm for you, but it's an automated system. Then you'll get an email a couple of weeks later saying your application is being reviewed by the Department of Ed. That's when it's been assigned to an admission or pre-screen committee. We're gonna be reviewing every single aspect of your application. Remember, like I said, we read and we verify every single component. So be truthful, be accurate. Um, and then last, you'll get that final email saying your application has been entered into our new teacher finder. And in new teacher finder, that's where you actually will start to do your job search for positions. Things, to, things for you to remember, you're gonna submit your application at teachnyc.net but you must be certified and you get your certification through nyse.gov, not the Department of Ed, right? But you're gonna do your job search through the Department of Ed. And I'm just gonna end with this note. These are some valuable resources that you can use, right? Research schools online, right? Because what's gonna happen is once you are in our database system, you're gonna do a search, right? And I'm trying to get to it, my apologies. You're gonna do a search for school openings, right? And so you're gonna say, I'm looking for teaching teaching positions for SWD 7 through 12 teacher candidates, um, principals that are hiring SWD 7 through 12 teacher candidates in Brooklyn, right? The system will tell you, these are all the certifications, these are all the schools hiring for that certification area in Brooklyn. Or I only wanna know this one block within Brooklyn. These are the schools on that block in Brooklyn that is hiring for your certification area that you anticipated. Or you can say, I wanna see all the SWD teaching vacancies in the entire bar in the entire city of new york here are all of them it's a living document so during the months of january february march right i would say check it every other week come our peak season remember when i told you budgets are released that document changes with the vacancies are listed on a daily basis i would check it that often during our peak season the months of end of may june july and early august right that's how often it changes now once i see a vacancy principal kenny robinson is looking to hire um, for my certification area, let me research that school. I'll go to the school's website, research the school, see the progress reports. I express interest in new teacher finder. Please let Ms. Principal Robinson know that I'm interested in teaching for him, right? Principal Robinson will get an email list every week from the central office saying that these are the people this week that have expressed interest in your school, but you wanna go above and beyond that. Don't just express interest by clicking on, I'm interested in this position, let the principal know in our database system. Send Principal Robinson, because his information is in there, send him a detailed cover letter saying why you think you would be an effective candidate in his, his or her school, and that you have applied to their school or expressed interest in their school need to find it, but you would love to take time when he or she is available to talk more about why you would be an effective teacher for them and attach your resume uh, to that email correspondence, right? You haven't heard something in, in a reasonable amount of time and a reasonable amount of time is four to five business days considering weekends and holidays, not that Principal Robinson, I just emailed you 30 seconds ago, you didn't respond, um, right? Because they're doing other things also, but give them four to five business days and send a friendly friendly reminder email. Principal Robinson, I just wanna make sure that you got my email, I wanna flip this top of your inbox, I'm really passionate about your school and come those peak seasons of the month, we have, normally we have in-person hiring fairs and events. This last year, we moved them to online platforms. It still remains to be seen, depending on how the pandemic goes, what will be our options come this May, June, July, and August, but there will be hiring opportunities or hiring events for you to engage with prospective principals and hiring managers. You can say, Principal Robinson, I emailed you last week because I'm really interested in your job. I'm so glad that you, you're at this hiring, virtual hiring fair, in-person hiring fair. Um, Thank you for taking time. Here's my portfolio. Here's a sample demo lesson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
right? All ways for you to be effective. Now, I wanna make sure before we leave time for questions, give you two pieces of information. Here is a map of our five boroughs, and this is a breakdown of our 32 geographic districts that make up the Department of Ed. 29% of our hiring is anticipated to happen within the Bronx. Another 29% of our vacancies are anticipated to happen in Brooklyn. So slightly under 60% of our vacancies are happening in two out of the five boroughs. So a good way for you to think about where you wanna spend your, your time and resources trying to find a position. Queens is the most competitive borough in all the five boroughs for every teaching vacancy that you see there. There's usually eight to nine times more people applying for that vacancy than, and than other vacancies across the city. The reason for that is Brooklyn and Queens is on the peninsula of Long Island. Queens is the first borough that you get into coming from Suffolk or Nassau County. So people who are also certified to teach in New York State who are living in Suffolk or Nassau County, they look to, 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 for positions in Queens. You already have Queens residents looking for Queens. People who border the parts of Brooklyn and Queens are looking for positions in Queens. Queens is the most competitive borough. Do I discourage folks from applying anywhere in the system that's of interest to them? No, I don't. If you're really adamant about Queens, I would look to District 27, which is down here. That's the far Rockaway side of Queens. That normally has more vacancies in Queens than other parts. I would look at District 24, 27. But I always tell folks, look, 14, 32, 19. They literally are blocks apart. District 19 starts where Starrett City is, right? Erskine, Gatewell Mall, for those who are Brooklyn-based, right? The very next exit before that was Howard Beach, right? You drive two more minutes down the Bell Parkway, you have that much more teaching opportunities available to you and a little less competitive, right? So I would say look within these two boroughs. After Queens, the second most competitive borough is Manhattan because obviously the lower part of Manhattan is a lot more um, commercial businesses, right? We only build schools where there are residents. And so, um, you know, it's, a, it's fewer schools within the borough of Manhattan as compared to the rest of the city. But if you're looking to teach within um, Manhattan, I would highly look at District 4, 5, and 6. And Staten Island, normally the math always equals out. The amount of people that are applying to Staten Island, it pretty much equals out about how many vacancies are in Staten Island. Um, now, last but certainly not least, let me give you some next steps. All right, so for my fall winter grads, this next steps and actionable steps are on the screen for you for my spring summer. They're also on the screen. I'll leave that up for, for a few seconds. And I can take two questions, Kenny, while I, before I move to the next one, our folks are taking down these next step action plans. Okay. Um, somebody just went on a website on Teach NYC. It's blank. They want to know, will there be virtual versions of those district job fairs? And then the other question, it wasn't in the chat, but I'm just being proactive for the students. Interviewing now, is gonna be done through Zoom and virtual and demo lessons. Are there any sites or like workshops that um, the DOE or somebody is gonna to have to kind of help prepare students for virtual um, interviews and demo lessons? Yeah, so great questions all above in no particular order. If you go to the Teach NYC website and you look at events, right, and hiring fairs and events, they're not listed there right now. Events and hiring events are only for folks who are um, in our database system, right? So once you apply and you're in our application portal, that's when we, when we have events, it's by invite only. Um, the events and webinars that are listed on that Teach website are for general public. And so to the ones that Kenny are talking about, like how to have an effective virtual interview, some of those things we'll offer to those externally to get get them um, you know, warm to what it's gonna look like this year. But a bulk of those things that we would offer are to those who are in our database system. Currently, we don't have any of those available right now because again, the application is closed. Um, but when it opens up in January, then yes, those will be available. So again, to all the questions above, the application, the webinars of how to effectively manage like virtual interviews and, and hiring fairs, those will be invite only, actual hiring for invites are invite only, and those will be for those who are in our database system, who are in New Teacher Finder. We would invite you to those for you to register and attend. Um, the ones that are on Teach are open to the general public. A lot more of those are like this kind of type of information session, um, but we will have some other things listed on there when the application starts to roll out. Um, and if, uh, you know, come the end of the year, early next year, um, but that's great, all great questions. Cool. And they had a question about leadership, like, you know, they're president of a society and beyond their resume, how else can they use that to leverage a position or, it's, you know, like, you know, stand out in a competitive market? Absolutely. Great question. So where I said in the application where it said, um, 
tell us about your work history, right? In that part of the application, it's going to ask you to tell us three different parts of your work history. The first one is going to say, tell us about your, um, where it says your work history. It's gonna say, tell me about your non-paid education experience, right? My student teaching, that's what I'm gonna put in there. Tell me about your paid education experience, paraprofessional, substitute teacher, et cetera, right? Tutoring, right, et cetera. I'm gonna pull all of that in there, right? Tell me about your um, non-paid, non-education experience, Talk about some of my leadership things, my club organizations that I ran, um, fraternities, sororities, et cetera, right? Tell me about that there. Now tell me about last, but certainly not least, tell me about your paid non-education experience. I sold the issues at Aldo. I worked at a library, et cetera, right? So there are different buckets that the system's gonna ask you to put information in. It's gonna start with, tell me about your, again, tell me about your non-paid education experience, and that's where people easily drop in their student teaching. Then it goes to paid teaching experience, Paraprofessionals up to teachers, charter school, parochial schools, private schools, right? All of that, examples of what you can put there. Tell me about your non-paid education experience. Tell me about that. What, what are some transferable skills? What some things that you learned about that? Then tell me about your paid non-education experience, right? All of that shows to the body of your experience and what you bring to the table in a competitive market. All right. How do you determine whether a school or administration is a good fit? Like, I guess, um, the link, I guess you showed earlier, um, it doesn't it have their school reports um, on that link. And then, you know, how do you stand out if you don't have a lot of experience working with children besides field work that you complete at Hunter? Got you. Great question. So, yes, Kenny is right. When you're researching schools, you can go to schools at nyc.gov, right, where it says find a school. You can put in Kenny Principal Robinson School's name in here or their school DBN, and DBN stands for district borough number, right? You can put that information in there. It's gonna take you to that school's individual website where you then can find out the school's progress report. You can find out the school's um, uh, uh, quarterly review report. You can see the school's testing scores. You can see the school's area medium income, et cetera, et cetera, all of which you can get a body of that. Now we do encourage folks to also research schools through third party entities that necessarily we don't manage, but you can get a sense of them. Right, so you can do things like chalk bead or like talk to your professors who might have talked to colleagues, et cetera, right? You can do a general search. You can check other um, websites, et cetera. And that's where we say use new teacher finder and other job boards, right? Check other things to say like, let me get a sense of how Principal Robinson and Principal Mitchell do it within their building, right? What's going on there? Um, and these are all things that you can also start to formulate a list of questions that you want to ask Principal Mitchell or Principal Robinson during the interview. The interview is not one-sided. You should not just be asking, or the principal should not just be asking you tons of questions. You want to make sure it's a good fit for you also. So ask Principal Mitchell and Principal Robinson questions also. Principal Robinson, um, what resources and supports do you have for first-year teachers um, outside of what the Department of Ed Central Office provides us in professional development and training, right? Do you have a high turnover of new teachers? Do you have a high percentage of teachers who are career changers who are um, alter teacher candidates, right? What supports do they have? Do you have collaborative efforts inside or mentoring outside of what the Department of Ed provides us as a first year teacher, right? Like ask these questions. These are how you get a sense of what that school looks like. And to the last point, yes, we will have online platforms and hiring fairs. How do you stand out on that? I would get a lot of things on like uh, Dropbox or Google Drive, et cetera, that upon request, you can send a principal either a, a sample demo lesson, like have a, a digital folder with tons of resources that you can provide a principal to really show to the body of the experience that you gained at Hunter and what you bring to the table, right? So have your best sample demo lesson. If you have a recording of a demo of a, of a teaching experience, have it in there, right? Like have, have this digital platform prepared upon requests that you can hit send. Here you go, Principal Mitchell. What you needed right now. I'm doing it from my phone as we're interviewing. It's in your inbox. Please take your time to review it, right? Don't send these things unsolicited, but upon request, you already have it ready. You're not scrambling to put it together. That's the way that you stand out in this competitive job market and in these virtual times, right? Being prepared ahead of time, having it ready, having it readily available to execute it upon entry, that shows that pre-planning foresight, forethinking to make sure that you're going to be an effective teacher. Um, Andre, let me just piggyback on, because I see some of the other questions. Um, LinkedIn, use LinkedIn to see if anybody you know is teaching at a school that you may be interested in to get insight or even 
to connect with them to say, hey, how should I prepare for an interview? What are the things that a principal is looking for? So definitely use networking, um, whether it's Hunter students, um, Hunter alums, or LinkedIn to um, leverage um, preparation for interviews. Also, um, you know, you covered it, but I just wanna um, really amplify transferable skills. Like um, just, you know, um, if you don't have a lot of experience working with children, your transferable skills. Also putting in extra work with your field work, just because you might be required to do 48 hours, nobody's gonna say you can't do 60 hours. Like you wanna stay and do extra hours to supplement or augment your experience. So, you know, you gotta figure out what's gonna be your recipe to stand out, like, cause you could only be the best you um, in, in this hiring process. So, you know, those are just some of the things, cause I see some of the questions that we typically get about how do I stand out? How do I, um, you know, um, demonstrate if I don't have a lot of experience, my competency. And, and also just with your resume, uh, I know a lot of principals tell me they don't wanna just see what you did, but they wanna see the impact of your work. So not that you tutored somebody, but you took them from a C to a B. Like, you know, show some outcomes. So Andre, I'll let you further expound on that. Oh, absolutely. You touched on a lot of great things and I'll piggyback also like, yes, um, showing showing data always helps. So you can show like, I was able to show this percentage of, or have this amount of my students increase testing scores by 5%, 10%, 20%, et cetera, right? Like showing that data, you know, data, data supports what you're saying um, as, re as it relates to effectiveness. Transferable skills, talk about those specifically, right? Like when I did this job, these are some things that I know that I can apply to your school, right? or some things that I wanna incorporate or I wanna be involved with in your school. I noticed that you have a very robust like chess club which your school was highlighted in their progress report, right? So I really wanna bring some of that learnings into the classroom because I was on the chess club in, in at Hunter, et cetera, as an example. I don't expect someone who is a first year teacher to have as much teaching experience as a 20 year veteran teacher. And we always encourage principals to have a good mixture of all of the above, right? You don't wanna have all your teachers be 20 years, 30 years within the career, and you have no new teachers, right? And you don't have a school where you have only all new teachers and you don't have any veteran teachers. A great collab, I'm a big sports fan, so I try to, I use analogies and as it relates to that, but right? Great teams have a good mixture of experience and young energy and insight, right? The new person coming into the career and someone who's a little seasoned who can help mentor and support and guide, right? So that you can have that great collaboration and effectiveness. Right, so all of those things are some great. So schools aren't just looking for all veteran teachers and all, or, or all new teachers. And I don't expect someone to tell me in their new teacher application as a first year teacher, it shouldn't have matched someone that had 20 years. But I wanna see that you're gonna be a strong first year teacher. And those things that Kenny highlighted will show that you will be a strong, effective first year teacher. Um, as it relates to, I saw in the chat for the, um, uh, the international visa, very earlier on, I gave you the link for our virtual system, the Zendesk write a ticket in there. We'll make sure that someone from the international office can follow up with more specific questions for you. Um, and you should also talk to Hunter, but if you use that Zendesk, that virtual system, you can create a, a ticket and someone from the international office team will, will, will schedule time to speak to you specifically um, for that. Um, loan forgiveness, somebody just mentioned loan forgiveness. Um, I, I'll take the question that talked about examples and a recommendation or there's tons of resources out there. You could just Google. There's handbooks that we provide in the School of Ed. Um, there's some things on our website. So those are certain things that you can just take the time and investigate. You have to like make sure you're investing in your success and be an advocate for yourself. So there's tons of resources, but you you have you can't be passive about your career. You have to be, you know, an active participant and your career success and other people will definitely support you and direct you to those resources. Absolutely, absolutely. Now to the question regarding loan forgiveness. Loan forgiveness is tricky because we do not issue the loan forgiveness, meaning we're not paying the checkout at the end of your loan forgiveness. Those are, those are federal programs. And so you have to speak with your particular entity, if it's Mohilo, if it's Fed Loans, et cetera, Everybody has different entities of which they 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 borrow their funds from. 
right? So whichever that entity is, you need to speak to them specifically about what are the requirements if you are think, considering loan forgiveness. And the reason why I say that is it changes depending on the entity and the year that you're doing it. For me, as an example, when I graduated, the loan forgiveness required me to be on a specific pay scale that they had where I was paying a specific amount for 72 consecutive months. I couldn't miss, um, I couldn't miss any one of those payments. It couldn't be short. It had to be whatever the amount was. For conversation's sake, let's say it was $500, right? I had to make every one of those 500 um, payment amounts for 72 consecutive months and that correlates to how many years. And I had to been teaching in a Title I or working in as an administrative role, supporting Title I schools, et cetera, for every 72 one of those months. And then they forgive whatever the balance of my loan was at that time. It changes, right? So you have to speak specifically to your loan entity about what they would require for them to forgive your loan balance at the end of the time. You will have to make payments, most of them, all, if not all of them. They do give you that grace period for like a year or so upon graduation where you don't have to make any payments. But again, that grace period does not count towards your 72 months. So these are questions to ask them, right? So if I don't start making payments in the first year of me teaching, right, then that means my 72 payment months of when they can start counting don't count till I start making payments. Um, and they'll tell you like, okay, you have to make that amount of like $500. You have to determine if that is a good fit for you. I've had people speak to their loan entities and they say, okay, with that amount that they're making me pay at the end of the time, I'm only going to get $4,000 forgiven, I rather pay lower payments and spread it out over 90 months or 100 months, whatever that they give me. You have to make that determine on a case-to-case -case basis and what the parameters of where they want you to teach and what are the things you need to do. Um, and that's why I apologize, I can't speak more to it because um, it's a little more esoteric by what entity is managing your loan. And the question about the DOE help with masters, um, usually, isn't that just specific master's programs? Like if it's a high need area, like bilingual or, um, you know, some area like that, I know they have initiatives where they help with masters, but it, if it, you're teaching English and you want a master's in literacy, they tend not to help. Okay, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the master's credit. So there are different places where you can get, um, and I'm putting the Zendesk ticket in as I'm talking. So there are different ways where you can get supports around your master's. So as a member of the UFT, they have some supports and resources as it relates to tuition. And they also have programs and co collaboration with institutions where you can get master's credit or get credit to move closer to your master's plus 30. So the UFT is one entity that you can use as a way towards your master's or master's credit at cost or at no cost. Um, other alternative options that you can take advantage of. We also have some financial incentives where you can take the funds and apply that towards academics. One of the ones is we call it, um, so I'm just pulling it up for you. It is a state run program. And I'm just trying to pull up the link as we're talking about. And so the program is if you teach in a specific list of schools across the state, it, they we provide you um, about twelve uh, twenty four hundred dollars um, at the end of each year if you return back to that school and had a successful um, had a successful grading the year prior. So as an example, if you teach um, in a Title One school that's listed on that list, if you teach at one of those schools and you, you teach for one whole year, you return back to that school for the following school year, you had a satisfactory above um, grading level, we give you $2,400 tax-free for up to three consecutive years, right? So you can do the math, um, you can put all that money together, you can apply that to go to Hunter to get your master's, right, and get your master's of ed towards cut your tuition costs down or bring it at cost. There's so many cost-saving measures that the Department of Ed has um, but again, a lot of those, you'll learn a lot more about that through your onboarding process and through our HR Connect website and through the UFT. Your UFT will provide you tons of supports and resources as it relates to getting your degrees paid off or um, going to get your master's and, and, and need to get it paid. The last question we'll take, because it's 5.30 and I want to be respectful of oh, your time. Uh, and, and let me just put the caveat, money matters, but make sure you start going in and making a difference because i know a lot of things have been salary related the money will definitely come but um one of the questions was um how soon can people start working on their 30 plus um 
you know, for that salary differential? Um, you can work on it as soon as possible. I mean, again, it's, it's the 30 plus credits. So you should talk to Hunter. You should talk to about like, Hey, what, what credits can I still take after my master's to get the, the additional credits that I need um, so that I can get credit for a master's plus 30. I think someone earlier mentioned that they were working on their second master. So some of the credit from your first master's might be applicable towards that 30 plus credits that you need. Right, so it's a master's plus 30. And for those who don't know, there are three scales. I didn't highlight the third one because it it, it very rarely applies to, to incoming teachers, but it's the bachelor's scale that we talked about. It's the master's scale, and then it's the master's plus 30. So if you have a master's degree plus 30 additional credits towards the education, right, then you're on a higher pay scale. Remember, I said the scales only change by years of experience and education. And that's why the master's plus 30 has a higher pay scale than the master's because it's more education. And then every year that you return back, you'll see the incremental salary increases, 5%, 2%, whatever it is, every year that you return back to teaching on that pay scale. So a bachelor's, year one, year two, year three, like we talked about, and then so forth and so on. But Kenny is right. It's not all about just the, um, it's not all about just the pay. Like do what you love, um, the money will come, you know, like Kenny said, everyone did not enter into the field of education to become millionaires, but we know that we have a valuable contribution to the success of society. Um, and so one of the other things is, like Kenny talked about earlier, there is an opportunity for you to also do some things that you love, and we call that, um, uh, we call that procession. Procession is a union-negotiated um, uh, um, pay scale for what you do outside of your teaching experience. So if you want to do substitute, if, sorry, if you want to coach a basketball team, football team, a club, take the, the school on on, on, on um, college tours, et cetera, right? Coach a chess club, a robotics club, right? You can get it paid anywhere from 50 to $55 an hour for doing things like that outside of your teaching experience, outside of your teaching requirements. So if you're doing summer school, you're doing after school program, you're doing recess, um, sorry, midwinter recess courses, et cetera, right? Those things are considered per session opportunities. You apply, you're like, okay, I see my school has this. I see the school two blocks off from me is offering this per session opportunity. Um, I want to apply for it. You'd apply directly into a, a system that we have internally and you express your interest in it. Or, or the hiring manager or the person responsible for that will will we'll contact you. And then if offered, you literally can get paid for 50 to $55 for, for every hour that you're doing that, um, that particular task or, 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 or entity or coach, coaching experience. And so I encourage folks to take advantage of procession opportunities that are, that pay, play into other passions of yours that you really love. Um, you know, like for me, I, I, I want to be around kids in, in the sports aspect. So I would coach a team, right? So basketball season, let me take on a procession opportunity to be a coach for my school's basketball team, right? So you can get paid extra for that. I don't say take on 50, 60 hours of procession your first year of teaching, because you already have a lot, but I've seen people get an additional 20 to $30,000 in salary a year taking procession opportunities. They, they go to the max of what we pay out. Andre, what I wanna do at this point, before everybody starts to like um, leave, put one or two takeaways from this session. and. I definitely want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Andre for taking time out his busy schedule to um, provide us with this time. Yeah, I, th I thank you all. You know, anything for Kenny, he truly is a great colleague and collaborator to work with. He's truly invested in your success. And, um, uh, you know, iron sharpens iron. Kenny always helps me become better um, at this and, and really see the perspective of what the needs are for the uh, education major. So thank you, Kenny. Thank you for allowing me a chance to speak to your students. Um, really want to tell folks is take the time, look at the look at the um, the schedule that I, we provided earlier about where you are, if you are a fall graduate and if you are a spring summer graduate, right? So that you can get things done in a timely manner. If you are a spring summer graduate, right? A lot of the things that we talked about, you don't have to worry about come till January, February. Take the semester, complete it strong, start strong, finish stronger in the semester, end it well, come January, right? Get, get, get those components that we talked about together, your, your certification letter, your transcripts together, right? Get all those things ready, get your resume worked on over midwinter break, right? Get all those things done so that when the application does open, you can literally just roll it out with ease. For my fall graduates, now that you know what you need, start working on some of those components. Complete that express interest form. It should take you 20 minutes, if that, 
right, to complete the express interest form so we have your information in our database system. Start working on those components that, that we provided or informed you about so that when the application does open, right, you can easily apply because you have all those things queued up, ready to go day one, right? But you still can engage with us through the express interest form. You'll get information, updates, et cetera, right, all throughout, right? Just know where you are within this process and know what you need to do this last year, of your schooling is going to be very demanding and taxing, right? So stay organized so that nothing slips through the crack because you don't want to, it is a marathon, not a sprint, right? So you wanna work through this um, all throughout the next few months so that you end successfully with your degree in hand and a job offer in the other. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Andre, and thank you all. Give yourselves a round of applause for being such a great and attentive audience and asking some really great and engaging questions. Absolutely. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your weekends and um, we'll talk soon.